So I just have one item for all of you at the top. Uh, you may have seen, because we just sent this out, but in response to uh, some of your technical questions about the closure of the Syrian embassy, I wanted to point you to the information we just uh, made public and kind of do a little overview of that just to make sure everybody has what they need on that. So in there we stated that uh, uh, the State Department is prepared to consider on the basis of reciprocity the appointment of a third party state to which the Syrian government may entrust the custody of the premises of its mission together with its property and archives and the protection of its interests. Alternatively, the Syrian government may seek the department's approval of its assignment of these responsibilities to a member of its locally employed staff who is either a citizen or a legal permanent resident of the United States. So this was in response to the question about the facilities and how they would be managed. Uh, in our view, the United States having, uh, having a custodial, uh, playing a custodial role is the, the uh, option of last resort. So we have to approve who the third party custodian would be, but, and we haven't received that yet, but that would be uh, the next appropriate step. Um, in addition, I know uh, there was a question about uh, the number of individuals that who would be impacted, uh, and we did uh, some uh, more intensive looking through on that question yesterday, uh, and the estimates are more uh, along the lines of uh, over a dozen Syrian nationals, uh, a handful of third-party nationals. Uh, there are no U.S. citizens uh, employed who were employed. Uh, at the embassy, as I'm sure comes as no surprise, and those would all be in Washington. Well, uh, before we move on, just mm -hmm. a, a couple things. Just so that that means that there are no U.S. citizens, were there any permanent U.S. residents? I mean, yes. because it, oh, there were. So okay, so that other option is so actually a valid option. It, it is up to them to propose right. that. But yes, and, and you say on the basis of reciprocity, but isn't there already reciprocity? I mean, you have a protecting power in Damascus. They've yes, allowed but the I was just—that that is the basis of it. So I wasn't. Right. I, that okay. was so the there, technical. There language. is reciprocity. I mean, there is reciprocity. Right. right? Mm -hmm. And you could be—you would be in a position to reject a choice if they chose, like you know, North Korea or something. You could say no, that's not a good idea. Sure, I'm not going to get All into right. a hypothetical, but we do need to approve I, the choice. Can I just carry on with that? Sure. Um, you said there were a handful of third, part, third country nationals. Mm -hmm. Are they obliged to leave too, if they're not Syrians and they're not Americans? Do they have to go too? Is that your understanding? Uh, if they're not legal permanent residents, yes. So even if they have a, a visa, because their employment would be. Their, their stay would be contingent on their visa, which would be contingent on their employment. Well, this gets very technical, so obviously it depends on the individual. Um, I don't have any more details beyond that to share with all of you. Okay. But can I just, to stay with that, um, mm -hmm. the decision to close the embassy is obviously uh, creating some waves in Damascus and in Russia. Mm -hmm. um, the Syrian foreign ministry has said that it's illegal and arbitrary and a violation of the Vienna Convention, and I wondered if you could address that. And then the Russians, are, the Russian um, foreign ministry is saying in a statement that this means that Washington's effectively renounced its role as a co-sponsor in the Syria peace talks. Well, I, I think it will come as no surprise that I disagree and completely refute uh, all of those claims. Uh, we are abiding by uh, not only the law, but every aspect of the Vienna Convention uh, on diplomatic relations, uh, as I mentioned, and as, as mentioned in the materials that we put out. Uh, the State Department will assume responsibility for ensuring the protection and preservation of the premises of the Syrian mission together with its property and archives if uh, such arrangements have not been finalized or approved by the Department as suggested by the, by the government by March 31st. Uh, so that is not a, a statement or a, a, a claim based in fact. Um, in terms of, uh, I'm not sure what the, the other Russians one was. are saying that this means that you're announcing your role as a co-sponsor because you're effectively. Um, Although you said yesterday that you're you're still having diplomatic ties with Damascus, you're effectively cutting off an avenue to have those ties through. Uh, that is absolutely false. Uh, we are uh, continue to be uh, committed to and focused on uh, seeing a political solution reached here uh, through uh, the Geneva process, through a diplomatic process. As we've said many times, a political solution is the only solution that will end uh, the the crisis on the ground in Syria. And uh, this is an issue that Secretary Kerry has uh, been speaking uh, with, of course, not only the Russians, but his counterparts around the world on, uh, and we remain an active and committed partner in that process. Have you actually seen the Russian Foreign Ministry statement? 
I have because not... it seems at least the one that I saw, maybe it's been corrected mm -hmm. since, but it was a bit confused. It was just talking about the suspension of operations of the U.S. Embassy in Damascus, not about the. Uh, I haven't seen the specifics of, of it. So I haven't seen the full uh, statement. That's the. the, okay. the as you know, our embassy that that is a long ago news story. So. Yeah, that's why I was surprised mm -hmm. by the date on the story, unless they've since corrected it. Mm -hmm. All right. Can we move on? No. Uh, are you still cooperating or coordinating with Russia regarding Syria? We are. W what are you doing? We're in close contact with our counterparts on that. This is an issue that the Secretary has discussed with Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, even over the past couple of weeks, even with the events in Ukraine going on. You, I would point you to the statement he made when he was in uh, London uh, this weekend about uh, their discussion of the importance on continuing to work together on these tough issues. We work uh, through the UN. Uh, of which we're both P5 members, uh, and uh, we remain very closely engaged <coughs> on it. And uh, uh, are, you, are you still planning to go back to Geneva too, to bring uh, the, the Syrians back to Geneva? Well, that that uh, that uh, that there's a, a hiatus, as you know, right now, but uh, we'll determine what's next in coordination with the UN and with the Russians and with other partners who have a stake in this process. Mm -hmm. There's some suggestion um, out there that's by maintaining that you still have diplomatic relations with uh, Damascus, that that's a tacit uh, recognition of um, Bashar al-Assad as, as the head of state. Uh, absolutely not. I think we haven't been more clear about our belief that there's no future for uh, Bashar al-Assad in, in Syria, uh, that anyone who brutalizes their people um, as he has, uh, has no future uh, in their country. Hold on a second. Yeah. I'm not sure I understand the premise of the question, but are you saying that the United States can, does not consider Assad to be the head of state? Well, we don't. We don't believe that he has a future. It, it <coughs> no, was a tacit but, recognition of his. But he is the head of state. He is yes, the head of state. Okay. But I, we're saying I'm. I'm answering the question on the I premises. Know. I understood it that it was an acknowledgement or a view that we thought he had a future. That there. he was legitimate. That he that he, has he was some, legitimate. Well, exactly. That he has some credibility to run sure. the country. Right. But you can't. You don't deny that he is the head of state, do you? No, but I, that wasn't the question that was asked. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, it kind of was. I mean, you've never I'm said that he's not the legitimate. I mean, you never said he is not the head of state of Syria, have you? You just said his days are numbered and you don't think that he should be. We have said he's lost his legitimacy, that anyone who brutalizes their people like he right. has has no future in Syria. Do we have any more in Syria? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. How can you say you are cooperating with Russia on Syria where today's statements from Moscow shows that you have extreme contradiction between your position and the Russian position on what's happening in Syria, especially after the Syrian uh, army took over the city of Yabrud. You know, they are praising mm -hmm. the regime and Hezbollah for uh, that action. Well, as has been the case for weeks, if not months, uh, there are cases where we have disagreements with the Russians, and we're happy to speak publicly about those as they come up. Uh, but there are still cases where we are working with them, uh, including the implementation of the chemical weapons uh, process, uh, including uh, seeing if there's a diplomatic path forward. It doesn't mean we agree on every piece. We don't, and we haven't uh, throughout the process. Uh, how do you view the, the falling of the Abrud area in the, in the hands of the regime? Uh, I know I'm not in the position, as, as you wouldn't expect, to give, of course, uh, battleground reports. I know we've seen these reports over the past couple of days. Um, you know, we've long said that there would be ups and downs uh, in this crisis on the ground, um, that there's only a political solution can bring an end to the crisis. Uh, that certainly hasn't changed. Uh, beyond that, I don't have any military analysis for you. Mm -hmm. Syria? Yes, sure, go ahead. Related to the embassy, mm -hmm. it's a little bit uh, technicalities. Okay. You said that uh, the, in principle you are looking for a third party or you'll be the custodian. When this thing is going to be effective, I mean, you didn't set a date for it. I mean, it's going to be after 20, 31st I think of I March? Would, I would point you to the, the, the exactly, the information that we, rele we released, pardon me, um, that if such arrangements have not been finalized or approved by the department by, before March 31st, uh, mm -hmm. there's a certain number of days I outlined yesterday that uh, certain categories of personnel have to uh, vacate. Uh, but of course, uh, proposing a third party, uh, third party uh, state to be the custodian is, is, is certainly our preference, and uh, we'll see uh, what happens next. The second question is related to the raised issue about the reality on the ground. Mm -hmm. It seems that even 
if even if you are repeating that we you don't you want to find a political solution, still there are preparation going on in Syria or Damascus in particular to for the rerun of Bashar al-Assad. Do you have any comment about that? I think we've spoken to this uh, a number of times about how we don't see, including just a few minutes ago, about how we don't see a place for him or a legitimacy for him in the future of Syria. One more. Tension on the Golan Heights between uh, Syria and Israel. You mean in terms of the reports over the last couple of days about uh, the back and forth? The and the, the mm -hmm. uh, well, we've been very clear about our concerns over the regional instability caused by the crisis in Syria, and that Assad's desperate at efforts to cling to power increases the propensity for spillover violence. Uh, Israel has a right to defend itself. Uh, we continue to call upon the regime to avoid any action that would jeopardize the long-held ceasefire between Israel and Syria and urge all parties to abide by the 1974 Disengagement of Forces Agreement. We reiterate our unconditional support for the UN Disengagement Observer Force in the Golan Heights and call on all parties to cooperate in good faith to enable it to operate freely and ins ensure full security of its personnel. We also express our deep appreciation for the willingness of countries to continue to contribute troops uh, to Andaf. Matt? Thank you. Move on. Uh, sure. Ukraine, Crimea. Yeah, slash. sure. Um, uh, first, can you give us um, what the administration's line is? Because I don't think the Vice President spoke to it precisely. I may be wrong, but I don't mm -hmm. think it had all been happened yet. But the, the takeovers of these bases and in, uh, in Crimea by sure. Russians or Russian uh, Well, affiliates. we strongly condemn uh, Russia's use of force in Crimea. The Russian military is directly responsible for any casualties that its forces, whether they be regular uniformed troops or regulars without insignias, inflict on Ukrainian military members in Crimea. Uh, reports that a Ukrainian military officer was killed yesterday are particularly concerning and fly in the p face of President Putin's claim that Russia's military intervention in Crimea has brought security to that part of Ukraine. Um, and we, of course, um, I would add, uh, the continued efforts by Russian forces to seize Ukrainian military installations are creating a dangerous situation. We condemn such actions. Uh, Russia should immediately begin discussions with the Ukrainian government to ensure the safety of Ukrainian forces in the Crimean region of Ukraine. And diplomacy, in our view, remains the only acceptable means of resolving this crisis. All right. Um, there was a suggestion made by a rather large number of members of the Duma mm -hmm. that the United States should go ahead and impose sanctions on all of them. And I'm just wondering, it seems to be a, a, an interesting kind of challenge here because they're basically asking, they're asking you to, to impose sanctions on them. And one, I want to know, is that something that is even feasible? Could you or do you have any interest in doing it? And secondly, if you don't do it, how, how do you defend yourself from the charge that Senator McCain and others, many others, have made that the response is weak? Well, be careful what you ask for. Um, but our executive orders that have been signed by the president uh, give us broad authority and flexibility uh, to sanction a range of officials, institutions, Obviously, there are a range of options under consideration. I'm not going to get into what we are or aren't considering. You saw seven uh, government officials uh, sanctioned just a couple of days ago. The question at this point is not if we will do more sanctions, it's when. Right. Um, I guess I'm not asking you if you're considering it or not. I'm asking you if it's logistically possible to do it. I mean, seven people or 11 people total is one thing, but mm -hmm. there's several hundred members of the uh, of I understand the that. You're saying it's, it, it's, it can be done? Technically, Matt, I'd have to check yeah. with our sanctions okay. team. But of course, we're considering a range of options. I'm not going to detail them further. Then do you know um, about any meetings with um, – there are a group of um, U.S. business people that have sought some meetings with um, uh, uh, Defense Secretary Hagel. Anything to, uh, to express concern about sanctioning – um, the, uh, sanctions that would affect them as well, uh, obviously, in their transactions with uh, Moscow. Is there anything that the State Department knows about this and has, has about the U.S. businesses? Have the U.S. businesses expressed concern to the State Department about this? 
I'm not aware of this meeting that Secretary Hagel is having. I'm happy to look more deeply into it and see if anyone from here is meeting with them as well. Do you have any idea who the companies are? or? No, I don't have a fan. Okay. Uh, but, uh, but so nothing's been expressed to the State Department from, from business? From uh, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with this meeting or anything uh, along those lines. But I, I can check into it. I'm happy okay. to. Nicholas? One more on Ukraine. Mm -hmm. can, can we go back to the conversation Secretary Kerry had yesterday with mm -hmm. the students? Uh, I may be wrong, but uh, it seems to me that uh, he was pretty worried about the, the crisis with Russia. He used some very strong words like uh, egregious uh, against Russia. He made a lot of historic references mm -hmm. about the World War II, the Cold War. Mm -hmm. So is the secretary and is the administration worried about the prospect of a confrontation with Russia about this crisis with Ukraine? I think what the Secretary's words represented yesterday were a strong concern about the continued escalatory steps that Russia has been taking. Uh, the rhetoric that we heard from President Putin yesterday and the fact that his language didn't match the facts on the ground, uh, and a question about uh, what Russia actually saw and wanted uh, from the future of the region. Um, but it wasn't, I wouldn't express it in the term of worry as much as uh, there's a shared uh, shared concern with many of our international partners about uh, their rhetoric, their escalatory steps, uh, and, and what they're doing. And I think that's pretty uh, clear uh, given the responsive steps we've taken, the EU has taken um, over the past couple of days. We talked a bit about in London about the, the build-up of the forces, the Russian forces, on, mm -hmm. on uh, the borders of eastern Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Have, uh, has the administration yet seen any move of those forces into, into the country? I don't have any update on military <coughs> movements on the ground. Obviously, it's something we're watching closely, and we're concerned about any additional step. We spoke a little bit earlier uh, to, to res in response to Matt's question about their movements into certain Ukrainian bases, but mm. certainly Crimea. Yeah. in Crimea, yeah. uh, certainly <coughs> we're watching it. Uh, it's, a, it's a concern we've expressed uh, directly to the Russians, publicly and privately, but I don't have any update in terms of what we're seeing on the ground. What do you expect from Ben's visit to Russia tomorrow? From Ban Ki-moon's yeah. visit to Russia, I would point you to the UN for that. Do you have any expectation, or uh, are you sending? Any I'm message? sure we'll be in close touch with them, but I don't have any update for you on that. General, have the US uh, noticed any um, further exercises by Russian forces um, along? I think it's the north, uh, the northern part, mm -hmm. which seem to be aimed at NATO allies. Mm -hmm. Any, Again, like I don't have any, any updates for you from here on, on movements on the ground or, or, uh, or what we're watching on the ground. Then there are, there's a letter from a bipartisan group of senators that's just come out um, uh, asking for mo international monitors to mm -hmm. be placed in um, eastern and southern Ukraine uh, to, to monitor mm -hmm. the situation. Well, we certainly support strongly that support that. Um, we understand that the OSCE has deployed international experts to conduct a human rights <laughs> assessment throughout Ukraine. Uh, in addition, international representatives are still on the ground in Ukraine at the invitation of the Ukrainian government under provisions of the OSCE's Vienna document uh, on con of confidence and security building measures. Um, we strongly support uh, the Swiss OSCE chair's proposal for a broader OSCE special monitoring mission that can operate throughout Ukraine and have, have negotiated in good faith in Vienna to garner consensus for such a, me, a mission. Uh, as of this morning, uh, 56 participating states agreed to this pr proposal, <coughs> uh, including, of course, the United States, and only <coughs> Russia has objected. And the OSCE operates by consensus, right? Right, is so my understanding. So there is no consensus. Correct. So there actually aren't any monitors. Well, they have they have deployed them, but obviously <coughs> well, uh, because of they Russia's no opposition, mandate, right? they haven't been able to uh, do what they need to do on the ground. Right. They can't do anything. So, right. um, so mean, what? Well, what good are they if they can't do anything? Well, they would be much more effective if they were able to do their job well, on the much ground. Much more. They would be effective And if Russia at all. Fe it feels as strongly as they do about, uh, about their concerns <coughs> about the treatment of minorities, then they should let them in. I mean, obviously you're watching this very closely and you must be planning for a wide range of scenarios. Mm -hmm. Um, how likely is it in the administration's assessment that we could see um, armed conflict between Russian and Ukrainian forces? I'm certainly not going to make an assessment of that. Well, uh, I mean, you could, I mean, 
you, you, it must be something that you're planning for, possibly, possibly in the back well, of Well, no mind. one wants to see, Joe, as you know, a military escalation in this case. And uh, Russia, President Putin himself, has, uh, has spoken about uh, an end to violence and has spoken about respecting that. Obviously, uh, steps like going into the Ukrainian bases in Crimea fly in the face of that. But I'm not going to make a prediction of what will happen between two countries. Certainly, that's not our hope, and that's not what we want to see happen on the ground. Uh, two very brief things. Today, um, President Putin uh, appointed um, the Secretary's good friend, Foreign Minister Lavrov, mm -hmm. to be the rapporteur for the legal entry of, or the le legal reunification of Crimea mm -hmm. with Russia. I'm wondering, one, do you, well, I only have one question on that. I have a second question. Um, on that, mm -hmm. I'm assuming that you don't buy Putin's argument that he made yesterday that this is simply like East and West Germany reunifying and that you would object to the idea that this is reunification? Yeah, we, of course, we, as you know, objected to every step of this, the referendum, right. the annexation, so certainly we would object to steps to right. implement that. But, but, the, but there seemed that the, the Russian rhetoric has changed from annexation to, well, this is just reunification, which you have supported in the past with the Germanys, which you presumably support with the Koreas. Um, uh, you don't accept that? No, we don't. All right. And then the second thing is that when you were answering a question about the Secretary's comments yesterday, mm -hmm. you said something about questions about what uh, Russia actually saw and wanted in the, in the region. What Their can you be more specific about sure, that? Are you saying that the administration did not? The administration had questions about whether Putin had designs on um, parts of its uh, parts of the former Soviet what Union. What we're saying, Matt, and what the secretary was saying yesterday is that they say one thing and do another, and so. Uh, you know, if they say they respect the territorial integrity of Ukraine, right. their actions don't match with that. Right. So, so then doesn't it, what, I, then how does it make sense for you to take them at their word, like, five years ago? Take, the, related to Georgia? Related to any part of the, I mean, if you, there were, you said <coughs> it raises questions about what Russia actually saw and wanted in the region. Haven't those questions been answered now? Well, what I was referring what, what I was referring to, Matt, is the fact that they say one thing, they do another. Um, that their interests in the region, um, obviously, they have historical ties and historical backing, as the secretary said yesterday. Uh, but certainly, I don't think we've just been abiding by believing them at their word. We've been watching closely. We've taken steps in response, and we'll continue to do that. Uh, one thing, uh, Jen, you said that uh, the Russians say something and do something else. How can you trust them in dealing with uh, Syria? Well, it's not about trust. Um, you know, but most of they, these issues are not. Let me answer something. your question. Um, you know, this is a case where uh, I think if you ask the Russians, I think they'd pretty clearly tell you they don't want to see uh, chemical weapons uh, living across, not living, but a chemical weapons uh, across Syria. Uh, they worked with us uh, in, on that end. They agree, and they've said publicly uh, they see a political solution and a political end to the crisis in Syria. They're not working with us on Syria or Iran, for that matter, as a favor to the United States. Uh, they have their own interests in those regions and seeing an end to that, the conflict in Syria, as well as seeing an end to, the, to Iran uh, taking steps to acquire a nuclear weapon. Yep. You mentioned the uh, word uh, or expression the political solution for the Syrian issue. Mm -hmm. Do you think there will be or there is a chance to find a political solution or diplomatic solution for the Crimea issue? Well, for Ukraine, yes, absolutely. That's what we're working toward. You are working with whom? With Russia, with our international counterparts around the world. That's part of our process. We think a political solution, a diplom diplomatic excuse me, solution to this is the only path forward. Yes, please. Uh, and yesterday, you mentioned that even the day before yesterday, that the, uh, the secretary was in touch with uh, uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov mm -hmm. after that criticism that he did it yesterday in the town hall meeting. He, was it there was a chance to talk to him or something? Or he, he spoke with him yesterday morning. They've been it. speaking regularly. Um, but nothing today. They did not. They have not spoken today. Um, so I understand that. Uh, you know, the, the political diplomatic solution would be ideal in this case, but mm -hmm. so far diplomacy has failed to yield a result. 
sanctions are, are sort of being, you know, shrugged off or laughed off by, by the Russian side. Um, is the U.S. considering at all at this point any kind of use of force or threat of use of force uh, to try to get the Russians to back we're, we're continuing to pursue the political solution, a political solution which includes a diplomatic solution, political pressure, economic pressure. They're actually, regardless of what is said by many Russian officials, there is a huge economic impact that we're seeing on the ground in Russia. Um, and that uh, is partly in, in response to the political steps we've taken, um, but also uh, some of the anticipation of the economic steps. Let me just give you a few examples. Um, Russian stock indexes lost around 17 percent uh, just a couple of days ago on March 14th, hitting their lowest level since 2009. Uh, Russia's 19 richest people lost $18.3 billion due to stock market volatility on March 3rd. The first day of trading after the beginning of Russian military intervention uh, in Crimea, that was the day of that. Despite um, the intervention of the Russian Central Bank, the ruble is at a five-year low against the dollar. More capital has already fled Russia this year than in all of 2013. And finally, forecasts for Russia's 2014 growth rate hover around one, under 1%. 1 Some even predict a negative growth rate. So we're seeing specifics here. And as I mentioned yesterday, the deputy econ minister uh, said that Russia's economy is in crisis. Um, so there are impacts. Um, you know, we will see what happens over the coming days, but our focus remains on a diplomatic, on a political solution. So in other words, it's not being looked at? It's not. We, ha we, we are, we, we are the, I just stated what our focus is so on. So that was a lot from all those statistics you just reeled off, that the administration is pretty happy with itself, pretty chuffed. Is it a gloat-free zone, or are no, you just Matt, to No, Matt, no one point? is happy with okay. uh, having to take steps. But what I'm conveying to all of you is that there ha we have seen an, a strong economic impact on the ground. So anyone who states there uh, hasn't been in Russia or outside is, is, is incorrect. I think it's not that there hasn't been. It's just whether Putin, President Putin is just willing to soak up the pain, which he seems to be at the moment. There doesn't, none of the, the threatened sanctions and the sanctions themselves have done nothing to head off his um, annexation of, of Crimea. At the moment, yes. But my point is that uh, there is real economic pain. And if uh, President Putin cares about the economy in his country, cares about uh, the economic impact on the people of his country, cares about uh, his place in the <coughs> world, uh, then th those are all factors uh, that should be looked at. But again, we're looking at this day by day. But do you seriously think that the Russian that Russia, Moscow, Duma, and President Putin are now going to renege on their absorption of Crimea. It's, it's written into their law now, isn't? I think, if I'm right, that they've gone that far ahead. I understand what the steps, uh, the steps that have been taken, but uh, we don't recognize uh, the results of the referendum or the step, the follow-up steps on annexation. Many, many other countries in the world don't recognize it. So this is an ongoing conversation. Jen, you seem, you seem to think that you, you're able to change Putin's calcula calculus by pointing to his role in the world. He seems pretty happy with his role in the world right now. And when you said he was on the wrong side of history in Syria, that didn't do anything. Um, so I'm just wondering why you still think that he cares. Well, I can't get into his mind, not that you're asking me to. I'm not. But I just do don't understand the, the U.S. looking at this, mm -hmm. why the U.S. thinks it, was be, it would be productive, helpful, or conducive to getting him to see things your way by, by repeating this over and over again, oh, you're going to be on the wrong side of history, oh, you're going to be isolated internationally, when he's, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't, has not ever, as far as I know, but, but certainly not in the last several years, shown any inclination that that kind of, that, that, that kind of uh, isolation or that kind of dismissal or loss of any place in the world is going to change his mind. Well, Matt, uh, we'll see and we'll take it day by day. Okay. There are real factual impacts. That was the point I was making. Okay. <coughs> More on know? Ukraine? No. Uh, Let's finish Ukraine and then we can go. Go ahead. Uh, can I ask one on Ukraine about the position of China? Mm -hmm. How do you evaluate their position emphasizing the uh, sovereignty and territorial integrity at the same time abstaining the vote in Security Council and being praised by President Putin? Uh, well, uh, again, I'm going to let China speak for themselves, but obviously, um, given China's history, uh, I don't think, um, you know, we don't anticipate that they're going to uh, get in the middle of, um, of the um, disagreement on this issue between 
Russia and many other in the international com community. Um, I don't have any particular analysis for you other than to say that, uh, you know, the fact that Russia is the, was the only vote against um, the UN Security Council resolution this weekend, that there are many countries around the world, uh, across Asia as well, lining up against the steps that Russia has taken, uh, just shows you how further isolated that they are. Jen, there are multiple reports that are coming in just now, which I won't expect you to okay. really have an answer, but that say that the Crimeans are going to withdraw their troops, I mean the Crimeans, the Ukrainians are going to draw their, withdraw their troops <coughs> from Crimea. <coughs> so far at this briefing, you focused your, the, your comments on the Russians mm -hmm. or the Russian, uh, I don't, the, the Russian Aggression. speakers, the Russian, no, the Russian, uh, the guys in, with guns who mm -hmm. speak Russian and you think are operating under the Kremlin's e e aegis. Uh, is this move, would, would, a, would a Ukrainian withdrawal from Crimea be, uh, what, what do you think of that? Would that be acceptable or was that, does that give in to what you say is an illegal annexation? I don't have all the details on this, um, so I'm happy to right. touch okay. base with our Fair. team. I will say, broadly speaking, the Ukrainians have been remark very restrained throughout this process, but let me check with them and, and get more details. Uh, go and, ahead. Any result for the meeting between Deputy Burns and uh, Saudi Deputy Defense Minister? I don't have any details on that. Let me see if we can uh, get a short readout for all of you Please, after the briefing. You. Sure. Go ahead in the back. Um, you tweeted several hours ago, uh, stop the shooting in Simferopol, clear that Russia shot first. And I'm just curious, what is this clarity based on? What, what are the facts behind this statement? Well, Russia uh, entered a Ukrainian base um, and uh, that's clearly an act that we have concerns about and shows uh, their level of aggression in this case. Uh, so I think uh, events on the ground seem pretty clear in our view, uh, and we were just expressing, I was just expressing a concern about the reports we're hearing on the ground. But now you said you talked about entering a base, uh, but in the tweet you were saying that it's clear that it actually fired a shot first, mm -hmm. and that's a pretty uh, serious allegation. So what, what is this information, where is it coming from? Because there's been plenty of conflicting reports on what actually has been happening in Simferopol. So we're just curious well, we as don't to see. Let me just say we don't see how it's possibly true that the Russian claim that uh, they were uh, they were they were not uh, that someone else was the aggressor that the Ukrainians were the aggressor can possibly be true given they entered the Ukrainian base. They're not saying that. They're saying it's a provocation. Whereas you're saying that it's very clear. And they have be said that a little bit. I think we're ready to move on. Uh, do we have another topic? Okay. Um, this goes to the Middle East. Mm-hmm. Uh, Middle East. Okay. Yeah. You are um, familiar or aware of the comments that the Israeli Defense Minister has made this week. Mm -hmm. What do you think of them? Uh, well, clearly his comments were not constructive. Uh, Secretary Kerry spoke with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu this morning, uh, and he um, protested to him uh, his concerns uh, about uh, these comments. Uh, we maintain, uh, the United States maintains an unshakable commitment to Israel's security. Uh, President Obama has provided an all-time high level of security assistance to Israel, including critical Iron Dome and missile defense funding, even during times of budget uncertainty, uh, to provide Israel with unprecedented capabilities and options that help Israel better deal with regional threats and challenges. And Prime Minister Netanyahu himself has said that the breadth of our security cooperation is unprecedented. So it is certainly confusing to us uh, why uh, Defense Minister Yalon would continue his pattern of making comments that don't accurately represent the scope of our close partnership on a range of security issues and on the enduring partnership between the United States and Israel. Well, what does it say to you about your, allegedly, I'm going to say now, close and enduring partnership when the Defense Minister of your top ally in the Middle East runs around making you know, insulting the Secretary of State and criticizing the President for being a wimp, essentially, and not defending Israel's interests. Does that really, I, how, is that reflective of a close and maybe enduring, leave that out, is that an indicti indicative of a close relationship with well, either I, the Defense Minister himself or the government of Israel, which employs this guy? I don't think it reflects the view of the government of Israel. Um, and I think it doesn't reflect uh, naturally our relationship. Uh, okay. What did? Uh, what, are you able to tell us anything about what the prime minister's response to Secretary Kerry was when mm -hmm. he protested um, Defense Minister? I'm not Yellen. going to get into that conversation. Do you have? A, do, you do, you, do you 
from from his call with Prime Minister Netanyahu, do you get the sense that Prime Minister Netanyahu agrees with his defense minister? I'm not going to characterize it, but I think I will uh, just clearly say that uh, I think there's a, a recognition and a support for uh, the strong security relationship between Israel and the United States by uh, by the government of Israel, and Prime Minister Netanyahu himself has said that many times before. Okay, so Prime Minister Netanyahu, uh, his comments to the Secretary are indicative of the, the, the understanding in Israel that this is a that this is a close. I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to speak to his specific well, comments, but he has said many times in the past publicly about his support for the strong did, relationship. Did the Secretary ask? That, then forget about. Bibi's response, mm -hmm. did the Secretary ask for either the Prime Minister to go out and make some comment to uh, and say something publicly? Did he ask the Prime Minister to tell the Defense Minister to go and make some comment, kind of comment publicly? I think the Secretary is, is uh, has a tough skin and is happy to move on beyond this, but did well, feel it was important to, to express his concern The problem about is the that it seems to go beyond just him and his, whether he ha has tough skin or not. Mm -hmm. The defense minister seems to be is questioning the very essence of the relationship and suggesting that the United States does not have Israel security at its, uh, in, you know, as as a as a policy anymore. That seems fundamentally at odds with everything that you have been that this administration has been trying to mm -hmm. say. Is it a good idea and, and for this guy to still have this job? That that is that is not something I would speak to. What Matt. what does it say about Prime if Prime Minister Netanyahu is not prepared to publicly rebuke the defense minister or fire him or at least say to say something to, publicly to say that he does not agree? What does that say about I'm the relationship? I'm not going to speak to what he is or isn't prepared to do. I just outlined what specifically the facts are, which you're very familiar with, about our security relationship. Uh, the, the comments of the defense minister are completely inconsistent with that. So that's what I would point well, you to. Well, would you like an apology? I, I, that is not. We're, we're ready to move forward and keep talking about the peace process, Matt. Can you just stay on this for one second. Mm -hmm. um, you just said that you don't think he was speaking for the Israeli government when he made his comments. But have you received that assurance from from the Israeli side? I think side? many many Israeli officials have spoken publicly, including the Prime Minister, uh, consistently over the last weeks, months, and years about the strength of our security relationship and the importance of our. Uh, the, the, the enduring bond between the United States and Israel. Sure, but I mean, previously when, I mean, in, in other cases when um, members of, uh, of a country's government make certain statements mm -hmm. that seem out of line or Well, I'd point you to the Israeli government. They, you can ask uh, them this question. Somehow they, sometimes they, those kinds of, uh, the governments of those officials mm -hmm. make it clear to you that it's, you know, I'm not that they weren't speak speaking for the for Israeli government. government, so you can certainly lob that question to them if you'd like. But does it concern you that you haven't received that I assurance? I think I've addressed this question. Next question. Uh, on the missing flight? Hmm? The uh, missing flight, sure. Yeah. Do, do U.S. and China, uh, what kind of cooperation do U.S. and uh, China have in sharing the information about the flight? Well, we're both. We're all working, I think the Chinese as well, uh, we're working with the Malaysian government. They have the lead on this investigation. I'm not going to go into more details about what information is being shared, but obviously we've put forward a number of resources uh, toward this effort, um, and I would point you to the Chinese on what resources they've put forward. But the Malaysian government is the, has the lead and is the coordinating body. Do the U.S. and the Chinese officials or investigators have any, any direct contact on the issue? U.S. officials and, and the Chinese officials. Again, the Malaysian government has the lead, so I don't have any further details for you on other forms of co coordination. Scott, you want to revisit your comments yesterday regarding Uganda and what the United States government has or has not done in response to the uh, anti-gay laws? Sure. Well, in response to your uh, question and the questions of others, we'll have a quite answer that's sent out um, broadly to everyone. One question, let me address first about. Uh, the group, um, the group that the secretary has spoken about, uh, may travel uh, in as part of the discussion they've been having. Sorry, that was confusing. What I just said. Um, as you all know, uh, President Museveni has publicly stated that his views on the innate nature of human sexuality informs his decision to support adoption of the Anti-Homosexuality Act. But he also expressed openness to discussing the scientific basis for these views with experts from the international community. Uh, we believe that facilitating such conversations may lead to more informed decision making on issues related to the bill and the treatment of Uganda's LGBT community generally. And we are in the early stages of working to make such conversations 
uh, possible. So there is, uh, that's still in the very preliminary planning stages. Um, also, uh, in, in the, uh, in the uh, comments I made on the 18 uh, foreign senior health ministry officials, with, uh, this, uh, these renewing stipends expired in January. Uh, they were paid to government employees to compensate them for extra time and work they expended over and above their normal duties in managing cooperative agreements. The suspension of these stipends is also part of a larger discussion with the government of Uganda about whether it should assume greater responsibility for government functions associated with the HIV AIDS response, including these supplemental stipends. So none of these funds, uh, none of the funds supporting these contracts uh, <coughs> were used to, just a little more detail, were used to purchase or distribute antiretroviral drugs and the expiration of these contracts will not directly impact PEPFAR's ability to deliver life-saving medications in Uganda, but this was an ongoing process before the signing of the uh, anti-homosexuality bill. So you are in the very early stages of putting together a team of who, like psychiatrists and mental health people who are going to go to, to uh, Uganda and try to convince Museveni that he's wrong on when he, when he in his in his conclusion educated I'm sure mm -hmm. in his conclusion that uh, that uh, homosexuality is a choice is that correct well uh, as I mentioned I would to discuss the scientific basis uh, for uh, for uh, his viewpoint or lack of a scientific basis uh, I can't determine what the outcome will be but uh, it is our, Good our luck. view. It is of our view that is worth pursuing. Okay, so. but uh, how about how, how about physicians? I don't have the list. It's it's so preliminary. There's no list of exactly. Is it who so this preliminary be. that it actually might not happen? Uh, no, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying well, it, there hasn't I mean, been a, there right. hasn't been a group put together yet, Matt. Well, okay, but I mean it hasn't it hasn't happened. It's very preliminary, mm -hmm. and frankly, you don't know if it's actually going to happen. Do you know if you have approached? President Museveni and said, "Hey, would you be willing to hear our group of a group of people from the U.S. or from group?" Of I don't know what together? level of the process we're at. It is in the preliminary okay. process. Scott, did you have another question? So oh. these salary top-ups oh. not related to the anti-gay. It was a process that was ongoing. Right. Yes. So, has there been any action by the U.S. government taken in direct response to this legislation? Uh, so we continue to be in the same place we've been in, where we're taking a thoughtful, deliberate look. Uh, next steps in light of the enactment of the law. Oh, did you hold on? Did you have another yes, Uganda? Go ahead, Joe. Oh, Uganda. Okay, go ahead. Well, Secretary Kerry said himself yesterday at the town hall that he'd spoke with President Museveni about this, and Museveni said that he would welcome a team of experts. Well, there but you go. I have to say that I think uh, that know, may have been when us, I was running upstairs from most here. Most of us would. I mean, I, I just don't understand how a team of experts would be able to persuade somebody to mind, given the perhaps a level of prejudice. Especially given the, the, per <laughs> given the person that you're trying yeah, to convince. Yeah. Uh, well, it is always will you, will putting you, the effort forward. Could you forward. proactively, I hate that word, but could you, when this team is put together and when it's about to mm -hmm. go, uh, could let you let you us know? know? Because I'd like to, I think there are some people, at least some of us, would like to uh, talk to them and ask them how exactly they intend to try to convince Museveni that he's wrong. We will keep that request in mind, Matt. Okay. Go ahead. Confusing for me from yesterday, how when you say you are going to cut the fund or freeze the cut the fund for the medicine practitioners, and does this well, it's not going to have an impact on the services, the health services they are giving to the patients. I mean, I mean how it comes. Well, out. there are a range of um, other dozens of other health officials who work directly with um, to provide those services. So. Uh, that's that's what I was referencing. Great. Uh, thanks, everyone. Oh, no, and oh sorry. One more. There have been several recent incidents in Hong Kong that have raised um, some concerns about press freedoms there. Um, I'm wondering if you have anything to say about those. Uh, I do. Uh, the United States is concerned about news reports about what appears to be another attack on media figures in Hong Kong. While the details of the most recent attack are not completely clear, we are troubled by a series of incidents over the past year that seem to target Hong Kong media figures. Hong Kong's well-established tradition of respect for the rule of law and internationally recognized fundamental freedoms, including freedom of the press, remain crucial to Hong Kong's long-standing success and reputation as a leading center of global commerce. We expect Hong Kong's law enforcement authorities will fully and transparently investigate these incidents. 
Thanks, everyone.